Okay, let's make a start, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Kirby Institute seminar series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Grulick, and I'm the head of the HIV Epidemiology and Prevention Program here at the Kirby. Of course, in, at, the, uh, at the beginning, I'd like to acknowledge that all of us, whether online or in the room, are on um, Indigenous land, unceded Indigenous land, and I'd like to acknowledge the, um, that I'm on the lands of the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, just a little housekeeping to start with, um, as with most of um, the Kirby seminars, this is going to take the format of a presentation and Q&A at the end. So do be thinking of your questions. If you are in the room, there are a mic there's a microphone on the side of the room. We want you to use the microphone because we have an online audience as well who won't hear your questions unless you use that. Um, for people online, welcome firstly, and you can uh, ask questions throughout the presentations by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, and for those of you who see an, a question there that you like, please upvote it, and that will make sure that your that question is more likely to get answered. Um, okay, with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, um, Professor Henry de Vries. Welcome, Henry. Uh, Henry is a dermatologist at Amsterdam University Medical Centres and Amsterdam Sexual Health Centre um, at PHS Amsterdam. By training, Henry is a dermatologist and he's a principal investigator and professor of skin infections at the University of Amsterdam. He also works at the very famous Amsterdam Public Health Service STI clinic, which uh, one of the, the best public STI clinics you will find anywhere, I'm told. <laughs> and the National Center for Infectious Diseases Controlled. He's involved in clinical, epidemiological, and diagnostic aspects of STI and emerging skin infections. Thank you for visiting us, Henry, over to you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Yes, I want to thank, a uh, special thanks to uh, Andrew and also Richard for this kind invitation to speak to you uh, today. Uh, I'm on a sabbatical leave at the moment for four months. Um, we, uh, my partner and I bought a, uh, a round the world ticket and definitely on the list was to visit the Kirby Institute uh, here in Sydney. So I'm happy to, uh, we're halfway uh, our uh, sabbatical at the moment. So this is the right time to, to be with you uh, today. Um, my presentation uh, will be uh, mainly about the situation in uh, in the Netherlands and in uh, in Europe. Um, I was uh, with our colleagues of the Melbourne Sexual Health Clinic, uh, and they asked me uh, to speak about that. Uh, and since we also need time to do some leisure, I didn't change much uh, in this uh, this presentation. So I hope it's informative uh, uh, for you. I would also like to acknowledge uh, and pay respects to the uh, Bijigal people of the uh, Aora nation and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And my talk will be about the situation as far as STI and HIV are concerned. Uh, since the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, uh, it hit Europe uh, quite early in March uh, 2020. I've understood already that it, it took a while before uh, you went into lockdown here uh, in Australia. Um, and there were some uh, people who had positive feelings about uh, the fact that we were in lockdown and hopefully a lot of people would also uh, uh, um, do uh, sexual distancing, that that might influence STI and HIV epidemics in a positive ways. We now know that uh, that didn't uh, materialize. Um, and I want to highlight what happened, especially as far as HIV epidemic, uh, MPOX, of course, which uh, seems to have a direct connection with the uh, relaxation of the uh, uh, of the lockdown measures uh, uh, in 2022. Um, what happened with syphilis, syphilis uh, recently, that's quite interesting also, and uh, something maybe a bit out of the scope of most of you, and that's scabious. We saw also uh, some interesting developments as far as the scabious epidemics uh, in, in the Netherlands uh, and also across Europe in that respect. So this is a graph of the uh, STI and HIV uh, uh, epidemic uh, in the last 30 years at our Amsterdam Sexual Health Clinic. Uh, and in the colored bars, the yellow is for syphilis, the red is for chlamydia, including lymphogranuloma venereum. And the blue one is uh, the number of cases of gonorrhea that we have seen. 
Um, and in gray, you see the number of HIV infections. Uh, and up until, say, 2005, we saw that they were quite uh, having the same trend upwards. Uh, but then in 2005, we saw a decline, a continuing and gradual decline of the number of new HIV infections, uh, what we've seen. And that's in contrast to the bacterial STIs you see in the colored line. They just kept uh, crawling up and up. Um, and that's now known as the decoupling between bacterial STI and uh, HIV. Uh, so a, lo a lot of our focus at the moment is on how to tackle these uh, this ever-increasing uh, bacterial sexually transmitted infections, uh, which you see, this is like a global trend, uh, so you won't uh, be very surprised by this. Um, what we also see, of course, is the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and mainly due to a lack of access to healthcare services, also sexual health clinics, or do we did stay open uh, during the lockdown period in, uh, in Amsterdam, but we could see about a quarter of the patients that we normally would see uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, pre and then uh, our lockdown measures were lifted uh, completely halfway 2022nd. Uh, and you see that it's just uh, uh, going back to the same uh, increasing trend uh, as before the pandemic arrived. So if you look at the number of new HIV infections and you split it down in uh, uh, gender uh, uh, and sexual uh, preference, uh, we see especially in the men who have sex with men population, a sharp decline in the number, uh, uh, the, the ratio of new infections that we find uh, in our STI uh, clients in the last uh, 10 years. Um, and um, this is different from what we see in the heterosexual population. We really have a focused epidemic uh, as far as uh, uh, most countries in Europe. It does differ. For example, in Belgium, uh, uh, which had former colonies in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, like the DRC, for example, you see also uh, a heterosexual transmission in Belgium. But in the Netherlands, it's mainly MSM who are uh, the key population as far as HIV is, uh, is concerned. And you see a dramatic decline. Um, what you also see here in the light uh, uh, pink uh, bar is that we also see some HIV uh, a new diagnosis in men who have sex with men who are on pre-exposure prophylaxis. So that again stresses the importance of uh, re re regular testing for HIV, also in a population that is presumably uh, protected against uh, uh, HIV. So what could be attributed, uh, uh, what could be the attributing factors to this uh, decline that we see in uh, HIV incidence in um, MSM populations? Um, that's probably uh, three things. Um, uh, we started uh, in 2014 uh, with an initiative called the H-Team, which stands for uh, HIV Transmission Elimination in Amsterdam. And it was uh, initiated by the late Joub Lange, who unfortunately died uh, on his way to the AIDS conference here in Australia in 2014 in the MH17 uh, uh, disaster. Um, and uh, this seems we ha have to have a very effective uh, uh, effect on uh, HIV transmission. Uh, we focused on awareness and testing, uh, which of course is important. And what we see now is that in the last stretch uh, to finally come to no new transmission in 2030 is the hidden populations, uh, as is also the case, as I understood here in, uh, in Australia. It's, it's much easier to reach uh, uh, MSM who are out of the closet, uh, uh, but there are a lot of uh, hidden uh, infections that are far uh, um, harder to reach uh, and get tested and into the health system. Treatment as prevention is, is of course, a very important uh, uh, policy uh, uh, to reduce the community viral load that had a tremendous effect uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this sense. And then later on, we started with uh, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis around 2015. So uh, most part of the decline is probably not directly attributed to the effect of pre-exposure prophylaxis. What is also interesting uh, to look at is lymphogranuloma venereum, which uh, is an aggressive form of a chlamydia infection, can uh, cause severe anorectal and also genital uh, uh, destruction, uh, uh, soft tissue uh, destruction. 
um, and that that's found in uh, in men who have sex with men since 2003. And in the beginning of the epidemic, we mainly saw it in about 80% of the cases in men uh, who have sex with men who live with HIV. And what we have seen in the last few years, around the time that we started to also with pre-exposure prophylaxis, is a completely turnaround. We see about 80% of LGV infections now in patients who are HIV negative. And a large proportion, and that's what you see here in the pink bars, uh, are in MSM who are using pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, so that's a complete change. Uh, uh, and again, you see the effect uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lack of access to uh, healthcare uh, institutions uh, here. The last bar in 2023 is only half year. We didn't have the results available, but again, that will exceed the, uh, the number of new infections that we've seen in 2022. And in the, uh, the black line, you see the percentage of HIV negative MSM who were diagnosed with lymphogranuloma venerea. So what is, can be attributed to this? That's also probably treatment as uh, prevention, which led uh, to the policy to consider uh, un, uh, 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 no viral load uh, that you're not uh, able, uh, able to transmit HIV uh, to your partners and PrEP policies could have lead to a decline in zero sorting. Something we saw 10 years back uh, that partner selection was based on HIV status, uh, especially since PrEP uh, uh, has been introduced on a large scale, we see that uh, there's a lot of mixing between uh, men who are living with HIV and those who are HIV uh, negative. And that can uh, explain the LGV transmission in a wider population outside of those living with HIV. So I already told you about scabious. Scabious is an ectoparasitical infestation, extremely uh, itchy. And in uh, Western countries, you see it's mainly transmitted via sexual uh, uh, contact, whereas in low and middle income countries, uh, you see it much wider uh, uh, um, um, transmission. Also in households and children are mainly infected uh, in, in uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, but in Western countries, it's mainly a sexually transmitted infection. And here you see up until the uh, start of the COVID pandemic, there was already a rise. These are incidence numbers uh, 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 collected by general practitioners uh, across uh, the Netherlands. You see already a steady rise in the number of uh, uh, scabies up until that point. But it went overdrive uh, uh, soon after the relaxation of uh, the uh, lockdown measures in uh, 2022. Here you see two bars. The red one is the uh, incidence per 100,000 uh, inhabitants in the Netherlands uh, over 2021. And you see it is there is some seasonal variation, especially in autumn and winter, there's more transmission of scabies. Uh, but the, uh, the 2022 blue line is uh, really exceeding and about a, we saw a fourfold uh, increase in, uh, in scabies uh, uh, and that coincides with the relaxation of the lockdown measures. Uh, which persons are uh, affected by scabies? That's mainly students, well-to-do students in large cities uh, around their 20s, 25. That's what you see here. These are the number of uh, prescriptions for scabicide uh, medications. And you see that most of them are picked up by those uh, in, in, in their early uh, 20s. Um, and that's not typical for scabies. We mainly saw it in uh, lower income uh, uh, populations uh, uh, and also people, uh, uh, homeless people, for example. Uh, and this is really something atypical for a scabies uh, 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 epidemic in a high income setting. Uh, we also saw some quite remarkable uh, uh, um, increase of gonorrhea among heterosexual women, uh, which is always a good marker because uh, uh, there are uh, uh, men who do not uh, um, 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 tell that they have sex with men uh, sometimes. But in women, we, we have a better uh, uh, look at what is happening in a heterosexual population. And here you see the map of Amsterdam. And you can probably recognize the horseshoe-shaped uh, canal pattern here in the center, in the medieval uh, part of the, uh, of the city. Um, 
And center, west and south, those are the more affluent parts uh, of Amsterdam. And what you see here is the number and also the incidence of uh, syphilis in 2019 as opposed to 2022. Um, other city parts like the north, south, east and uh, new uh, west, they are the less affluent uh, parts, uh, a lot of migrants living in those areas, and we already saw a pretty high uh, number of uh, 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 gonorrhea infections in those city parts, uh, and that didn't change over the uh, lockdown period and the pandemic, but we did see a, a doubling of the number of gonorrhea infections in the more affluent parts in the city center. Uh, as you see here. So what are the expl explanations? What happened during uh, COVID time that led to the increase of some uh, uh, SDIs? Not, for example, HIV. We didn't see that. Uh, we have a, a, a study that was recently published in uh, the STD journal of January this year, um, where we looked at sexual behavior among uh, men who have sex with men. It was a questionnaire that was spread out through uh, social media uh, dating apps. Um, and here you see the main partner type proportions, um, those with a steady partner, those with casual partners who uh, they could trace and contact, and unknown casual partners, for example, in saunas or in, in dark rooms. And it's divided in five periods. Period number one is the period before the pandemic, uh, period number two is the first lockdown, uh, which went until about May 2020. And then we had a relaxation period. Uh, we were thought, whoa, we are, uh, we are through uh, with uh, uh, COVID, but nothing uh, uh, is surprising that in the fall of 2022, we had an even more strict lockdown than the first one, which lasted until uh, March 2021. And then slowly uh, uh, lockdown measures were uh, relaxed up until March 2022. And what you see here is that uh, especially those with unknown partners, uh, um, it's even higher if you compare period one before lockdown compared to uh, 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 period five after the complete uplifting of all the lockdown measures. And what you also see is that during period two, uh, um, there were uh, um, less persons who had unknown casual partners. Uh, but during the second lockdown uh, period in period four, uh, probably because people realized it wasn't that deadly as was assumed uh, in the first phases of the pandemic. Um, um, the, the number of uh, casual partners was higher uh, than during the first lockdown uh, period. Um, and you see the same pattern uh, as far as sexual distancing, uh, which was apart from social distancing, also uh, uh, very much propagated by uh, the government. Um, this was applied to, uh, in the majority of cases, in the first lockdown, uh, but then in the second lockdown, it was only uh, a third of the persons who, uh, who were complying to sexual distancing. And if, again, you compare uh, period number five after lockdown, it's uh, even less than uh, during the first uh, phases of the pandemic. So that could explain some of uh, the effects of COVID uh, on uh, uh, sexual uh, um, 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 behavior, uh, uh, which uh, uh, exposes uh, persons, MSM, but probably also the heterosexual per population to uh, uh, in, at a, a bigger chance to uh, bacterial uh, STIs. Um, the next subject I want to uh, address is uh, MPOX. Uh, uh, we were one of the first countries who were affected uh, in 2022, uh, in, the, in the early spring. Um, and uh, in May 2022, uh, it was acknowledged that in several countries in Europe, Spain, Portugal, the UK, and also in the Netherlands, uh, uh, MPOX was being transmitted among the MSM uh, population. And if you compare it to the situation, what we knew about MPOX before May uh, 2022, um, there were two clades, uh, a central and African clade, clade one, and a West African clade, uh, clade two. Um, and they were already for many, many years, dating back to the 1950s, 1960s, uh, uh, on a, a, a frequent uh, um, stage, they were uh, being, uh, there were outbreaks uh, in, in sub-Saharan uh, countries. Uh, sometimes they were imported uh, outbreaks uh, from friends and migrants who visited uh, uh, their uh, country of birth. Uh, and then in London, in New York, for example, you had small household uh, outbreaks. Uh, the clinical picture 
uh, was what dermatologists also refer to as monomorphic. So all the lesions apart, they look like one another. And that's what you see here in the hand of this uh, small child from, from Ghana, umbilibated papules and ulcers, but all lesions are alike. Uh, and that's different what I'll show you later on, what we saw uh, uh, at the moment in, uh, in, in MSM. Uh, so there was limited human to human uh, uh, transmission, mainly droplet borne via coughing. Because uh, that was an all other clinical uh, uh, characteristic that there were airway, upper airway uh, symptoms also. Um, zoonotic transmission was always the source of uh, uh, these outbreaks, uh, and then household spread uh, uh, started soon after. Uh, contact uh, with small uh, uh, um, mammals, for example, uh, they, those are the the the, the reservoirs for uh, the Mpox virus. Uh, no sexual transmission and also no anal genital lesions were reported up until 2017. There was a study published in 2019 from Nigeria, but for the first time they saw an association with uh, sexual transmission. For example, sex workers were uh, uh, a considerable part of the uh, Mpox uh, cases that they described in that, uh, in that report. And the mortality was quite high, 10 to 1% was uh, uh, being estimated, but that's probably because only at the tip of the iceberg entered the uh, epidemiological uh, statistics. Only those patients who were severely affected, and those were mainly children and pregnant women, they uh, uh, probably via hospitals that they uh, were admitted to uh, were diagnosed with Mpox. And the large proportion uh, uh, did not uh, enter the, the statistics. Uh, but that's this, the, the figures that we had in mind when it first uh, uh, was described in, in Amsterdam, that it was there, there was a considerable mortality. Although the clay that was the case in the Mpox outbreaks in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, on a global perspective after May 2022 was the less dangerous uh, uh, to be uh, clade. Uh, the far majority, about 99% uh, of the persons who were affected by gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. And of course, sexual transmission and close contact were the most uh, uh, and rarely upper airway symptoms uh, were seen. So no extensive droplet borne transmission was considered to take place. Uh, and I'll show you some of our work that can explain uh, uh, how that comes. Um, here you see a picture of uh, a man who uh, described what his disease progress was uh, through time. And you see it's a far more polymorphic uh, image. It's more like eczema or rash. And that's when I saw the first patient, I didn't recognize it. It was because we tested it back two weeks uh, uh, that we found that it was Mpox. And it was the nurse who attended me, it was, uh, who, who notified me. And he said, you remember the, 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 the couple? Uh, and I thought it was a herpes simplex, uh, which was uh, impetigonized uh, with a bacterial infection. And that's a bit what you see uh, here uh, also. And apart from these polymorphic uh, uh, skin presentations, severe rectal pain, and penile edema uh, were being reported. Uh, and another aspect would we see, see now that the stigma is, of course, always very important, but there were a lot of gay men who were quite open about uh, their disease and wanted to help also to notify uh, partners, uh, par partners and community members of uh, uh, the fact that uh, MPOX uh, was going around. Uh, and the mortality, luckily, was far less. Uh, it's estimated to be one in a thousand of those who uh, contract uh, Mpox that uh, eventually died of the disease. Uh, we looked at the viral load uh, uh, in certain body location, lesions, skin lesions to uh, uh, anal uh, uh, compartment and to the throat. And here it is uh, depicted on the y-axis in cycle threshold. And that's how the PCR machine works, the less DNA is present in the initial sample, the more often you have to repeat uh, uh, these cycles. So a higher cycle stands for a lower viral load in the initial sample that you have collected. And you see that especially the lesional and the anal uh, uh, lesions uh, had a far lower cycle threshold, which means that they had a higher DNA load uh, compared to the uh, throat lesions. And that again could explain uh, the the, the fact that uh, uh, airborne transmission wasn't a significant part of uh, what was going on uh, during the epidemic. Some of the lesions, they were 
quite severe. Uh, patients really described it as pain that they haven't had uh, uh, before, especially the anorectal uh, infections were uh, really excruciating. And even with uh, op op opioids, uh, uh, analgesics, they were very hard uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to relieve. Um, here you see the extensive necrosis that can uh, take place. Just to help you to orientate, this is the knee of a patient. Uh, and you see how big the, the uh, single pox could come, uh, could become. And it was often also the reason that people were admitted to the hospital. It was just for pain management uh, only. So here you see the picture uh, uh, up until now. This is a, a cumulative uh, 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 map of the number of cases that were diagnosed. And the Netherlands was about the fifth most hit uh, 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 country in the European region. And within the Netherlands, Amsterdam, uh, which is in dark uh, uh, dark red over here, we took about half of the total number of cases that were found in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and obviously that's because the, uh, we have a large MSM population residing in the capital. If you look at a, a, a global uh, part, uh, it started mainly in Europe, but most cases in the end, uh, because now we see very little transmission going on at the moment, most cases were eventually uh, uh, um, found in uh, the United States, North America, and in Brazil, as you see, can, can see here in blue. And uh, as far as I've understood, in the Western Pacific region, you were better prepared uh, because uh, you've heard what was going on. Uh, and there was quite limited uh, number of MPOX cases diagnosed here in Sydney and in Melbourne, also because vaccination was ready at hand. Uh, and that took a while before we could start vaccinating people. Uh, but you see that within a year, uh, the, the peak was around uh, the summer. It already started to go uh, down. What are the causes of this sudden disappearance, or at least uh, for now, of MPOX? Um, awareness and behavioral changes. Uh, we had a very uh, good connection uh, already for many years with uh, the different communities most affected by STIs in, in the Amsterdam area. Um, so we had quite extensive uh, podcasts and other forms uh, of uh, communication. Uh, and for example, uh, gay bars that have um, dark uh, rooms and also gay saunas, they really saw a considerable drop of about one third of their income and revenue, uh, uh, probably because people uh, uh, were not uh, uh, having um, sex with unknown partners. Uh, group immunity could also be an explanation. Vaccination, as I said, we started pretty late, uh, around August, June, July, August, uh, when we were already over the top, uh, when we look in retrospect to uh, what happened. Um, um, some people said it would, had to do also with the festival season, the fact that it started in April, May, uh, when the first festivals, uh, uh, large gathering, gay gatherings start in, in Europe. But we didn't see a revival uh, uh, the year after uh, around festivals. Uh, What's probably also important is the network structure, uh, uh, the way SDIs are being transmitted in uh, MSM uh, networks. Uh, and there was a very nice modeling study uh, published in Science uh, in 2022 by Endo and uh, colleagues, um, where they what they uh, um, designated the heavy tail sexual uh, network, which you see in uh, in, in gay uh, populations, where there is a heavy tail at the end of persons who have extremely high numbers of sexual contacts. This is the number of partners over 21 days. Um, and that is probably a very important core group uh, that is able to uh, have continued transmission within that group of not only MPOX, but we saw the same thing with lymphogranuloma venereum in the beginning, hepatitis C, for example, uh, also. Um, and that could have led pretty complicated scale, but here you see the R not, uh, the R not the the, uh, the reproduction uh, number. Um, whereas as soon as it's over one, you have a sustained transmission in a population of a certain uh, infection. And in an MSM population that uh, has these characteristics with this heavy tail of persons who have a, a very high number of sexual contacts over a limited person of time, that can push it over this threshold that is needed to have a sustained transmission in a population. And that is something that never happens in a non-MSM population. And that's also what we saw. We didn't see any 
significant transmission to uh, non-MSM persons. So what is ahead? Um, this is a recent report from uh, WHO, where they now for the first time saw that in the De Democratic Republic of Congo, there is sexual transmission going on of uh, uh, clade one, uh, the more dangerous, probably the more uh, pathogenic uh, clade. Uh, um, so this is here they refer to the clade two, uh, which was the, the uh, ongoing globally among men who have sex with men. But now in April 2023, they described first a case, uh, a man who resided in Belgium, who had connections with the DRC, uh, uh, who also um, was uh, had sexual uh, contacts uh, outside of the country. So um, that is something we should pay attention to, that it can still re-emerge and that also other more pathogenic uh, clades could be uh, at stake, uh, apart from other zoonotic viruses, which of course uh, are highly prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. So what are the take-home messages as far as MPOX is uh, concerned? There's a discrepancy uh, as far as the outbreak before and after 2022, as far as the symptomatology, but also the key populations that were affected and the mortality rate, or that that can be uh, uh, caused by uh, um, the epidemiology and how uh, surveillance is going on. MPOX is a new STI among MSM. It is here to stay. Um, and there is a striking overlap with the other outbreaks we've seen uh, in this population, like I already mentioned, lymphogranuloma venereum and hepatitis C. And the network structure, the heavy tail hepatitis hypothesis uh, could attribute uh, to that. Uh, and we should prepare for future zoonotics out outbreaks, strengthen surveillance and health infrastructure in low and middle income countries uh, where most of the zoonotic infections seem to emerge from, uh, but not all. Uh, uh, in bio industry in, in the Netherlands, we also saw quite some uh, uh, threat uh, as far as zoonotic infections are concerned. Um, and be vigilant for unusual presentations. Okay, quickly some something about uh, uh, the syphilis epidemic. I also understood that in Australia now you see quite some uh, syphilis transmission in the heterosexual population and also uh, a re-emergence of uh, congenital syphilis, which is a drama in itself, as you can, uh, uh, can say so. And that has been preceded by the situation in the United States, especially the southern uh, states of the, uh, of the U.S., where congenital syphilis uh, uh, has increased in the past decade about tenfold. Uh, and uh, this is a more recent uh, publication, in the New York Times, uh, where they uh, also uh, uh, indicate the rise of 80% of syphilis in general uh, since 2018. We don't see it yet in the European uh, situation. Uh, it's especially uh, males who are affected uh, by syphilis and not so many uh, females. But when you break it down to countries, you see there is a big difference in the male to female ratio. Uh, here you see the Netherlands on top. Uh, what you see here on the X axis is the male to female ratio. And it's a, um, uh, it's a logistic scale. Uh, for each male uh, uh, we see in, uh, or for each female we see in the Netherlands having uh, syphilis, there are 40 males. So mainly men who have sex with men are affected. And that's quite the opposite from what we see in the former Eastern European, European countries like Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary, where it's more a, a generalized epidemic uh, and uh, heterosexual transmission is, is, uh, uh, is quite often uh, uh, the way it spreads, uh, which leads to a more even male to female uh, ratio. And here you see a breakdown also as far as sexual preference that you see the far majority of the cases still found in, uh, uh, in, um, in Europe are seen in men who have sex with men and not so much in heterosexual population. But that could change, uh, especially if you look, for example, at what's happening with gonorrhea at the moment and what is happening in Australia and the United States as far as syphilis is concerned. So how to move forward? What are we going to do about this? What I would like us it's something we could discuss later on also, but there are two uh, points I'd like to uh, address now. Um, and that's first of all, chlamydia testing. Uh, we for years have tested chlamydia uh, and told our population, you should get tested for chlamydia because it can cause infertility. It can cause uh, PID. Uh, uh, so even if you have no complaints, 
but there is a chance that you have uh, chlamydia based on your uh, sexual behavior. Come and get tested. We've done it for years and years, but we see absolutely no effect, uh, which you can see here in the flatliners uh, from the past uh, 10 years in the European uh, community. Uh, what we see on the other hand, if you look at pelvic inflammatory disease incidents, we see a sharp decline in the past uh, 30 years or so. And that take place in uh, in countries where they have very strict chlamydia screening surveys going on. For example, the Netherlands, but also the Scandinavian countries were uh, uh, very keen on it. But you see the same and the same uh, uh, magnitude of decline in countries who absolutely did nothing about chlamydia screening, like Ireland, for example, and also uh, Belgium. So that raises the question, first of all, about money, uh, is it is it uh, 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 is it worth it if you want to prevent late sequelae like PID and uh, and infertility? Uh, and there is probably a, a harm benefit balance uh, at stake. Uh, and first, we were more focused on uh, uh, the possible benefits uh, to block chlamydia transmission, uh, to prevent chlamydia uh, complication, and of course, which is of course. Uh, uh, not the reason uh, which is mentioned often, it had sexual health uh, on the agenda. It uh, was also <clears throat> one of the, uh, the effects of it. Uh, but there's also a downside to testing, uh, especially over treatment, and that has come uh, to the agenda uh, uh, at the moment more often, antimicrobial resistance by using a lot of medication. Uh, apart from psychosocial effects on partner uh, uh, breakups because STIs were uh, being diagnosed. Um, so that led to the idea that we shouldn't fight infections, but we should uh, do something about diseases, infectious diseases, as opposed to sex, uh, uh, um, um, asymptomatic uh, in infections. So there's a discussion going on at the moment. This is a, a, a paper from the group of Jane Hawkins in, uh, uh, in, in Melbourne, uh, where they also state that asymptomatic screening of not only chlamydia, but probably also uh, gonorrhea in men who have sex with men, uh, uh, especially now with PrEP and the advice is to have uh, STI screening every three months. Uh, aren't we doing more harm uh, as far as overconsumption of antibiotics than we do good uh, in preventing late sequelae of these asymptomatic infections in most cases. Uh, and this is a paper uh, uh, from uh, a group of uh, um, um, European uh, um, um, colleagues who come to the same conclusion uh, uh, that we should, uh, that there's very little evidence about the re reduction of uh, infection prevalence and associations with diseases are weak as far as especially chlamydia is uh, concerned. But it leads to overconsumption of antimicrobial resistance, uh, antimicrobials, and the risk for uh, uh, um, antimicrobial resistance. So, especially in high prevalence populations like MSM who are on pre exposure prophylaxis, we should reconsider what we will test. Uh, should it be gonorrhea and chlamydia, uh, or should we only focus, for example, on HIV and syphilis, uh, which are the most dangerous one on the longer run. So for that reason, we now uh, um, um, advise to no longer screen asymptomatic clients of public health uh, settings on chlamydia uh, in our latest uh, uh, STI uh, guideline. It hasn't been adopted yet by GPs who are more reluctant, and also gynecologists uh, uh, are uh, not uh, on the bandwagon yet. Um, and we need more, uh, for example, we, we don't get paid if we don't test for chlamydia because it's in the law, so that needs to be changed. So hopefully somewhere in this year, we can abandon chlamydia screening in asymptomatic uh, clients. Toxipep is another uh, uh, probably effective mode, but if you look at the studies, they, the main effect was on, again, on asymptomatic infections that were uh, being prevented. Uh, and there is a downside, of course, uh, uh, when you look uh, uh, at the use of doxycycline uh, uh, in, as a post-exposure prophylaxis uh, after having unprotected sex. So at the moment, um, we think there is not enough evidence for the effectiveness of doxypep on the long run, and especially the downside as far as antimicrobial resistance is, uh, is concerned. So we do not advise it yet, although we do realize that a lot of people in the community already use it uh, and the demand is high. 
And that was the same standpoint I found in Melbourne. And I'm curious to hear what in Sydney you think about uh, Doxypep. So to conclude, um, we saw already a decoupling of bacterial STI as opposed to HIV before uh, uh, COVID. Uh, and that can be attributed to a lot of the policies uh, as far for HIV fight that we have uh, introduced. We are, have a window of opportunity to stop HIV transmission by 2030, especially or at, uh, at least in, in metropolitan areas with a, a good infrastructure. Um, we saw a change in LGV uh, as far as uh, the HIV status of the patients who uh, get uh, lymphogranuloma venerium, which could be attributed to abandonment of serosorting. Um, there was a temporary decline in STI, uh, but that has rebounded, probably due to uh, the, the, the fact that behavioral change didn't uh, occur, occur, and there was no new transmission uh, uh, set point uh, of the com community bacterial load. Uh, and syphilis, scabies, and gonorrhea are examples of outbreaks that uh, uh, are now seen among young affluent heterosexuals, something we didn't see before COVID-19 uh, was the case. MPOX is a really wake-up call uh, for future zoonotic uh, outbreaks and the role of sexual health clinics in that respect. And um, yes, we see differences in syphilis epidemics across the world, but it can change rapidly as being experienced now. Uh, and um, I think we should stop asymptomatic screening, not only of chlamydia, uh, but also of mycoplasma, for example. There is a big lobby coming from uh, diagnostic industry uh, for newer uh, uh, pathogens uh, who are in search of an indication, as they often call it. Uh, uh, but that's not the way forward with if we want to uh, uphold uh, antimicrobial stewardship. And we, the future will bring us uh, what doxypep, what the value of doxypep is in the fight, especially, of course, against syphilis, uh, where it seems to be effective. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, the floor is open for questions. Thank you very much, Henry. That was an absolutely fascinating presentation. A lot of similarities with Sydney, but some really interesting differences as well, I thought. I don't believe we have much in the way of... Um, online questions yet. So making his way to the microphone now is uh, Dr. Nick Medland. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, Nick Medland is my name. I'm here at the Kirby Institute, uh, also the chair of the Australian SGI Management Guidelines and uh, co-led the um, our DoxyPEP, Australian DoxyPEP consensus statement. Uh, and it's amazing seeing your summary, great presentation, your summary slide, how interconnected all these issues are and um, you'll be aware also of the paper published yesterday, I think, uh, in Lancet HIV, um, comparing screening to non-screening uh, for gonorrhea and chlamydia in asymptomatic um, MSM and um, transgender women in Belgium. Uh, and I guess I'm what interested in your opinion on the potential for um, uh, unintended consequences of changing our guidelines. So in that study, um, not surprisingly, uh, these men got less doxycycline if they didn't receive their chlamydia diagnosis uh, and there was no harm done to them, it would seem. Uh, but there was a little bit more syphilis in that arm. Uh, so they may have been having some um, a doxypep uh well, their um, chlamydia treatment may have been working at doxypep, and which brings you back brings us back to your initial point about how successfully we can re really decouple uh, STI testing and screening from syphilis and HIV. Uh, so that's my question. Really, is um, uh, how concerned are you about um, uh, unintended consequences in um, changing of um, community? Um, uh, screening patterns? Yeah, that's a very important uh, uh, question you're raising here. Um, I think we should really focus more on uh, chronic infections like syphilis uh, and HIV. So I would say that that should be uh, uh, the main focus. Uh, and only in, in case of symptoms, uh, uh, there could be uh, a reason to screen for other uh, uh, organisms. Um, the thing is, we... we Syphilis testing is still hard, uh, especially to come with a correct diagnosis. Uh, syphilis uh, diagnosis is, 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 is complicated. 
uh, you need two serological tests, uh, for example, to see if it's an active infection or a past infection that has been treated uh, uh, well. So I think we should invest in, in more simple ways to test uh, uh, for, for syphilis. Uh, um, and um, it, it, it's, it's a very dangerous infection. That if it, if it, that, that's what we know. Uh, so I think we should pay more attention to to syphilis uh, uh, for now. And I just <clears throat> add a positive consequence mm -hmm. that, that we can't also neglect, as well as the things that you mentioned. You know, in Australia, we our system is absolutely struggling um, with providing enough care, um, follow-up visits to people on PrEP, because our current guidelines say four times a year, yeah. uh, both for a prescription, but also because of the STI diagnosis. Um, if we could make those visits half as often and make them twice a year, it would be a tremendous help in getting more people onto PrEP. Um, and I think it's a it's a health services issue, if you like, but um, uh, one that I think, at least in Australia, we need to address that issue. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, we, we did the same thing. The only worry, worrying thing is about what do you do with for HIV testing? Um, are you already uh, uh, that far that you would also... Uh, um, um, advice half year HIV testing. Uh, so I think yeah, abandoning chlamydia and gonorrhea testing uh, or bring it down to half a year or only on indication when someone has system, symptoms, that's no problem. But um, I think HIV testing, as I also showed you, there is, although it's very low, it's in the same range as we see the incidence in, in, in heterosexual uh, clients. You do see zero conversions in people who are supposed to be on pre-exposure prophylaxis. And that's probably the, the, the case with those who use it uh, uh, event-driven. Uh, and that's a considerable proportion of the persons in uh, in Amsterdam who use it event-driven. And you can make, yeah, uh, you can have bigger issues with, with non-compliance in that group. So I think HIV testing at a three-month basis, but it's also something you can do at home with a rapid test. Uh, for example, uh, so that could be provided uh, by uh, and be a, a serious uh, a budget cut uh, to have more people on prep. Because I'm not uh, how how is it in, in in Sydney? Is everyone who wants prep able to get it? Uh, because we have a long waiting list uh, of people who want it, who zero conferred being on the waiting list for HIV. Yeah, uh, yeah, we it's a. It's a great question with probably a long and complicated answer, but if, if I can just summarize it saying in the inner city, we have pretty good health services and most people who want to be on PrEP can get it. In the outer city, it's yeah. in the outer suburbs, it's completely different with very few doctors even knowing what to do and very few being gay friendly enough mm -hmm. to, 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 to handle it well. Um, so I think um, releasing... Um, the capability of our sexual health services to, if they could see see people less frequently, it would give them the added capacity that we really need. So I think, and and we've been given some um, some encouragement by our national health minister had an HIV task force last year, and one of the recommendations was to investigate less frequent monitoring mm. of people with PrEP. And I, I think uh, that is something which we at the Kirby in the research framework absolutely want to want to look at. There's a couple of interesting questions online, which I might jump to if I might. Um, and one of them is from one of our prominent um, sexual health centre physicians, Dr. David Templeton. Um, we, we probably have quite a few sexual health physicians online, I suspect, who can't be here because they're in clinic today. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, David has a question about asymptomatic LGV and, and wonders what proportion of the LGV notifications that you're getting are asymptomatic because David says we've never, we've, never seen a large proportion of asymptomatic LGV where rectal chlamydia samples have routinely been tested for LGV. Okay. So a question about asymptomatic yes. LGV. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, I re we've quite consistently see uh, about 25% um, of the cases of LGV who are found in, uh, in patients without any symptoms. Uh, 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 we've done a large survey in the Netherlands, and it was also uh, confirmed by a multi-site study in, in the UK, uh, where they also found the same, uh, about 25% are asymptomatic. Of course, the question is always, are these uh, folks not 
pre-symptomatic. If you would have waited longer, would they have eventually uh, developed symptoms? Uh, but based on uh, this fact, uh, uh, we routinely screen all MSM with a chlamydia infection, at least if it's anorectal, uh, for LGV. Uh, we test further. We don't do it in urethral uh, positive uh, chlamydia samples because mm. that's 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 very low. Uh, the number of uh, urethral LGV infections uh, uh, we find, and we will continue also to screen not so much for chlamydia in asymptomatic men who have sex with men, but we will continue screening for LGV in that population. Right. That's uh, interesting, and I wonder if it might underlie some of the um, the the difference that we see that we we've never seen a lot of LGV in. in in Sydney. Okay. Uh, we do see some, but the numbers are relatively low. Yeah. yeah. Good. I see a couple of sexual health physicians nodding. I got that right. <laughs> so that's, that's, it's only uh, considered to test in symptomatic patients with anorectal symptoms. Is that right? Do we only test symptomatic patients in Australia? Uh, it varies from side to side. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Two, two more online questions. And one, one's a very, an intriguing question. How, how do your patients deal with a cultural shift? From, from 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 having been told for ages that yeah. three monthly yeah. testing is what you must do to a new situation. How, yeah. How's that yeah. going? <laughs> yeah, that's the million dollar question. I don't have an answer for it yet. <laughs> I had an online meeting ye uh, yesterday uh, uh, in May when I get back. Uh, we really want to start with yeah, media campaigns. Mm -hmm. And we're now really considering how are we going to bring this message? Mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's true. Uh, 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 we, for 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 thirty years at least, uh, we've been uh, instructing uh, the population to get tested for chlamydia because you will get uh, infertile if you don't uh, if you miss it. Uh, so that will be a challenge. Uh, and um, we also look at how the communication was around COVID. Uh, uh, it's probably the same as here, but you had ever changing uh, uh, rules and regulations about wearing ma face masks and 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 distancing, and that changed every well two weeks uh, at least, uh, which brought, of course, a lot of uh, disbelief also and skepsis in the uh, in the population. So that's one of the things we're worried about, mm -hmm. that we will lose uh, the trust of the community mm -hmm. uh, with a completely different message at now. Uh, but still, uh, we plan to, to, to communicate it as best as we can. That's what it sounds like a real challenge. We have one more online and then we'll come back into the room. There was a question about uh, the, the difference between East and Western Europe with syphilis, with it being yeah. mostly gay in the West and, and, and quite a lot of heterosexual in the East. Is there any research evidence which explains or other evidence which might explain that hmm. why the difference at all? I don't know. No, no. It's it's something that dates back to the uh, the Soviet uh, period. Uh, and uh, that's why it's also so intriguing because we see it occurring now in in in, in Western countries, the US and also in Australia, mm -hmm. where you see uh, um, 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 yeah, HIV transmission uh, among uh, heterosexual uh, partners. Uh, I have no clue why at this point it starts to change uh, and why from a historical perspective, uh, uh, it's been completely different in Eastern European countries. Mm -hmm. well, Okay, we're coming towards the end of our time, but we have one question in the room here, Curtis. Yeah, hi, uh, Curtis Chan. Um, so when you had brought up this idea of the cultural shift, oh, well, the question brought up this idea of the cultural shift and moving away from the message of three monthly. And we found here that even with our current guidelines of you know quarterly testing, not a lot of people were reaching those recommended testing guidelines. Mm -hmm. And given your presentation was about the COVID period as well, I was kind of wondering if you saw a drop in testing as well and whether or not actually that change to less frequent testing might be easier in a period when testing might have been disrupted. Um, so you refer to the situation when there was lack of uh, access to the uh, uh, sexual health clinics in the COVID period? Yeah. In relationship to... Well, we found here that even after COVID, we were out of lockdown periods. Some of the HIV testing was disrupted and didn't really bounce back. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's slowly creeping up again. But okay. uh, I was kind of wondering if that you know, people kind of break the habit and then yeah. don't really go back for quarterly yeah. testing, if that was similar in yeah. Amsterdam. The problem uh, is we, 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 we cannot uh, cater all the people who want to get tested at our clinic. And that has to do with the fact that it's free if you test at the STI clinic uh, and you have to pay uh, out of pocket uh, the tests when you go to the GP. So there is... <laughs> 
no never we we do not uh, experience uh, any drop in the number of people who want to get tested because it's already full to the brim uh, as far as our capacity uh, so you we i had i would have to look at the gp data to see if there is a drop in testing but as far as i know there hasn't uh, it came back to the same as before the, the point that's that you've raised i think curtis referred to it there about um, the, the need possibly to keep people well connected with HIV and syphilis testing, yeah. even if there's adjustments in gonorrhea and chlamydia testing, um, you know, it's going to be an interesting one to approach. You know, we know we can test for HIV at home now with yeah. home-based testing. If we could have a well-accepted syphilis home-based test, then it would, then it would be, yeah. that would change the game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But I don't think we have that yet. I think we have some people in the audience who might be doing some work there. Is there yeah, we've done some study. The, the problem is, is, is mainly have, getting enough blood. So you have all these devices now, but dry blood spot, you don't get enough blood for uh, uh, the non treponemal test. And you really need that in a population where there's a lot of syphilis and you need to make the distinguishing between an old treated uh, infection and an active infection. So now you have these, uh, these devices you can put on your arm and they suck about an one ml blood, that will probably do it. But they're very expensive mm. uh, at the moment. Right. So it's the amount of blood that you can draw at home uh, uh, by someone to do it themselves, uh, which is the limiting factor for proper uh, syphilis diagnosis. Right. Uh, and testing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we are now officially out of time, so we'd, um, we'd better wrap up. Um, we could go on. I think we have a lot to learn from each other. You could hear from the audience. There's a, a lot of similarities and some differences. But if you could join me in thanking Professor DeVries for a great presentation. Thank you.